All right, so we're here in Kingston Springs, Tennessee, which isn't too terribly far from me, with Bryce Hollingsworth from, where are you from anyway? Well, I'm originally from Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm based out of Western Massachusetts, but I travel all over pretty much. And, and uh, Martin Beavers, and Martin works here around Nashville, right? Get it? And uh, their their specialty is tr traditional dry stacked stone masonry, like these walls. So we're here to get an education in stone masonry. Stone masonry is something uh, it's traditional stone masonry. I've just been obsessed with for years, and um, and it's it's a trade that is so. I mean, not that they all aren't, but so tightly um, connected to blacksmithing. So many stonemasons in history were were uh, decent tool makers in and of themselves because they made they made and sharpened and worked on their own tools on a regular basis. So yeah. anyway, we will probably be doing some some tool making collaborations in the future. Oh, 100. <laughs> so guys, uh, yeah, show us around. Um, where are we? What is this site next to the busy highway with these right. short sections of walls? Tell us about it. Well, when I was getting a visa, um, when I was setting up the application to get my visa to work here, um, they want a little bit more than just come in and building walls, taking the money back to England, if <laughs> I can't imagine ever doing that. Um, so it was part of the deal to actually give something back to America. I became friends with a guy called Dan Brown, who is the site coordinator of the Tennessee Historical Commission who has to get some of the old walls that are really prevalent around Middle Tennessee, he has to get them repaired and his experience was there weren't too many people who could do dry stack walling correctly. Now it just so happens my background in England was repairing a lot of the uh, agricultural walls, the walls that are still used around farms and it's it's a very common kind of trade over there, it's one that's needed all the time because they're always falling down, they need to be repaired, animals will damage them, it's a proper job over there, less so here and the trade has kind of died out, For, from his experience he couldn't get a dry stack wall up to repair a lot of the walls so they were getting repaired with mortar they looked kind of dry but they weren't built right the guys didn't know how to they were sticking it together with the inside full of mortar and that was killing the historic integrity of these walls so he helped me get my visa um, and the deal was to trace it's a lofty ambition but we're, we're starting um, is to reintroduce the trade of dry stone walling back to Tennessee that's right uh, and that is the start and the end of it um, I built a wall here um, I just happened upon Leslie who funnily enough she owns the site and she uh, she's also from Sheffield in England and we oh, met wow. over here it's <laughs> yeah. just a bizarre coincidence she said I would love you to do it anything I want she's made possible so it started with one wall I became part of the stone trust now do you know or do you want the history of that yes or? please give, us a, give right. us a quick rundown on the stone trust uh, the stone trust is the only dry stone organization in the United States that offers DSWA certification uh, DSWA stands for the dry stone walling association of Great Britain it's originally from the UK, but it's all over, it, and it's international. There are locations throughout the world, and it is pretty much the standard for dry stone walling. So if you want to be a certified waller, and you want to be able to hold yourself to a standard, a license even, basically, uh, you have to go through the Stone Trust. Uh, and the Stone Trust is in the midst of expanding to multiple different expansion sites throughout the U.S., including here in Tennessee, thanks to Martin and all the work he's put in here. Uh, it's an organization I'm heavily involved in, and, you know, it's based out of Dummerston, Vermont, which makes a lot of sense. There's lots of old stone walls. Yeah. I mean, there are thousands of miles of stone walls in New England, uh, but it's 
something that needs to be expanded so that we can make sure there are tradespeople that are properly trained and held to a certain level. Of quality and craftsmanship. Exactly. And to expand the knowledge base. More people need to know yeah. how to do this and how to do it properly because there are, there are walls all over that need to be restored. They didn't know up in the New England area <coughs> that there was a, such a strong tradition of, of dry stone walling in Tennessee, specifically Middle Tennessee, mm -hmm. on the very much the old European ways of building these walls with these vertical copes. Yep. They didn't know that. Yeah. So I've kind of educated them and all of a sudden they, they go, you've got, you've got a workshop site there. Do people want to learn it down there? They now know about the strong tr tradition here. Right. And they have supported me 100% to, to get it, promote it, um, sell, sell the, the tickets to come. And so that is the hub now. They, they are pretty much the place you go to to come here and learn and we're getting people from all over i want more people from tennessee they're coming from there was a, a girl who came down from rochester new york because they wanted to come they wanted to have a weekend around nashville so yeah. it's a good yeah. spot yeah. It's, yeah. it's just falling together beautifully so what, what you've put together here is a site mm -hmm. where um you host classes yep in dry stone walling and these are your your test or example walls that get torn down and rebuilt. All the time. All, All the, time. the time. And more importantly, it's also a site where certification exams can be taken. Yeah. You know, you can take a workshop, you can take a class, you can learn the basics, but also this is a testing site. People can come here and get certified. They can take, you know. They can make it a career. Exactly. Yeah. This, this you can come here, get trained, test get internationally recognized as being capable in this trade and then you can work in tennessee and restore the historic walls right here yeah instead of having to fly to vermont yeah to try to learn something and just like every other traditional building trade nowadays that's quote unquote dying um it's if it, you just display a a uh, basic level of integrity and quality and you can make a job out of it. For me, you absolutely can. For me, growing up in England, and it being very much part of my tradition, it's, like I say, it's a very common job. We are glorified farmhands yeah. back in England. It doesn't have the same romance, I would say Or the same pay. Yeah. And that's what you are. But it's also meant that we never lost the trade. Right. Here, the knowledge disappeared at some stage. It only only there needs to pockets. be for a couple of yeah, a couple of generations, of and then you, you, the people here now who are doing it, they've had to they've had to go out their way to learn it, to get tested before the Stone Trust. That's they right. did a lot. Yeah. A lot of them went over to England. Yeah, I mean, or even, Ireland. The practical need never to, disappeared there. Right. No. Would you? I'm sorry. This is a rabbit trail, but I, I grew up a woodworker. I have to ask. Do you think that it's because uh, you know England's been settled for so long and yes. and timber is has always been a precious commodity, and over here we we just got hardwood out our eyeballs. Do you think that's what killed the stone wall here? I have a cheap theory. Lumber fences. I have a theory. I don't know if it's right, but I can support it. I, it I don't know if it's right. I'm gonna it, say it anyway. <laughs> it kind of makes sense, right? In England, our walls were established. Yeah. By the 16th, 17th century, there was a network. The stone the, is all there. It's there. The walls were built. That's yeah. my bit of land. They were boundary walls or they were animal enclosures. Right. It was all there. Done. Now, what I think happened was, over here, um, you, obviously it was much later when the Europeans came over, and there was a period of dry stone walling. The trade was brought over and practiced. Yeah. But in 1860, 54, I think it might be. 1854, they invented barbed wire. Yep. Yeah, that makes you sense. Know We'd already that. got our walls. Yeah. So it didn't you matter didn't that it was, they were there, so you yeah. keep fixing them. But if you've got a choice of spending hours and the money, the materials, and, the and skill, everything, building a yeah. wall, or just stringing up some barbed wire, yeah. Yeah. I think that played a part. Yeah. And it disappeared. 
Yeah. And that's about the time. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the historic rebuilds I do are usually 1850 or earlier. Yeah. Even in New England. Of course, from the wood side of things, I, I know a little bit about the history in in the colonies in America and in the South, like split rail fences mm. were the thing right. up to the Civil War. Right. And then you have barbed wire comes in. Most of the, uh, of the vast majority of the rail fences in the South were destroyed by the armies of both sides, right. burning them for fuel, burning them just to get rid of them to hamper infrastructure or whatever. And barbed wire really came along and replaced it at right. that time. But anyway, well, show us some walls. Let's. Uh, sure. uh, we're geek, sitting here geeking out about history, but I'm sure some people want to see what we're talking about. <laughs> In the classrooms, right? We will start with this diagram, and it's very. A lot of people think these walls are just one-sided. They've just got a single stack of stone, but that will show you very clearly. Bryce, go through it, man. Not a problem. So, as Martin was saying, a wall has two sides and is battered, meaning it leans up onto itself. Hold this for a second, Martin. So literally, the walls are not plumb, right? They're battered in. So you have two sides leaning on each other, almost like a zipper, right? You start your foundations here, which you want to start below grade. You want them to be your biggest stones, most stable, and it's got to be able to handle this kind of weight. You want to lay the stones length in, angled in. You know, if you have to go level, that's about as level as you want to go. You do not want to be pitched down, right? If you're pitched down, the force of this, the stone's going to want to slip and move out. You want the weight down so that's pitched back and it pins the stone together. It's all friction and gravity, right? So you build up your courses to your first lift, which is about halfway ballpark and you put in a through stone, which ties the two halves of the wall together. It's very important that you do this because it gives so much structural integrity to the two halves being married. Within, you see these small little blobs here, that's harding, small stones. You use them to pack the spaces in between and underneath your wall stones because you want to create a solid space. You don't want airspace. You don't want the ability for things to move, get in there. You don't want water to get in, soil, leaves, things like that. So you want to minimize the amount of airspace possible and make it so that these stones don't want to move. If done properly, a wall built in this way will outlast any mortared wall. I mean, there are, there are dry stone walls that are thousands of years old. The pyramids are dry. Machu Picchu, dry. Okay, they've been here for a while, they're not going anywhere. So, in the event that you don't have a through stone, because as you can see, finding something of that length might be difficult, you can do what's called a dead man, and they have two halves that meet in the middle, either touching or overlapping side by side. It's less than ideal, but it's still better than nothing. Yeah. And then, once you've laid your through stone, you continue up, battering in, so the wall thins up so you get to your top height. Now in New England, a lot of times that's where the wall stops. A lot of the walls that were built in New England were actually unfinished. A lot of people left to follow the timber industry or they migrated south. But, so you'll see a lot of the walls you see in New England are uncapped and they're exposed. That also is a problem because it allows water to get in, allows soil to get in, allows animals to get in. And then with the freeze-thaw cycle, cause stones to move and get pushed out. So the cope stone, which you see right here, vertically coped all along here, actually adds a lot of strength to the wall. The wall is stronger by having the weight on top. But also, as well, it's like a mini through stone on top. Exactly. It ties yeah. the top little bits together as well, the both sides. And the shape of the stone, like this, actually protects it from a lot of water because it has the water will run off the sides and you're covering up the middle of the wall so it's very practical and sometimes that can get lost people don't realize just how important that yes. is discourages critters from climbing over the top too Among other <laughs> and what's interesting is here's one we made earlier this is oh you obviously didn't see that tv show um, 
But yeah, so there's the diagram, and this is the real thing working, doing all that. The only thing you're not seeing here is a through. But the through, were we to place a through, it'd go about here. The through stones are placed three foot on center throughout the wall. You can see on that wall, the ones that slightly protrude, those are your throughs. Um, and this is a perfect example of the diagram we just showed. You can see the length of the stones coming in. You can see your harding packed. You can see the natural taper of the wall up to your top stone here. This is what the guts of a wall looks like. And, uh, you know, it takes some of the mystery out of it. I think a lot of people kind of build it up in their heads that it's this crazy mystical thing. And it's like, no, it's just you follow the rules, you build it the appropriate way, and you do a good job, and they won't go anywhere. You know, simple as that. Beautiful. Yeah. Could we see a few stones laid? Yeah. We could throw a couple up. I reckon a three would go just I there. I think a three would go just there, in fact. I've got a three. Oh, do you? Yes, I do. Alan, let's scoot over here and we'll be able to see them put the, be able to see them work on the back. So there's his through stone. See that? He puts that about halfway up so that it ties the whole wall together. And that helps keep the, the wall, the two sides of the wall from bulging out and falling out. Perfect tie, right there. And then you continue on, build two and over. So the bottom of the wall now is secure. I always thought of this as, as being like two walls. You've got the bottom bit tied together and then the upper bit, which you'll trap together with the coat. It's Now, do you ever have to do any shaping? Oh, yeah. For sure. But, well, but you try to avoid it. <laughs> well, no, no. Here's the thing. Um, stone types in England, I found, are very much softer. For the first several years of my, me walling over there, and I got taught by a very old guy. Um, he was 85, and he'd built all the walls of this farm, where I'd just shown up and said, can I practice on your walls? <laughs> and uh, he never used the hammer. Wow. So it was all about finding a shape, fitting a shape. Um, here, the first thing I did, and I came here, came here with one hammer, and I worked <laughs> up in, and it was a little one, yeah. uh, and I went up to Vermont with where the glacial till is, and you got the granites, and you use a lot of tills over here. Yeah, it's hard to Which you must be very pleased about. <laughs> Um, you kind of got to, the, the stone dictates, so you will do some degree of shaping. It's another skill which you need over here. Um, I think equally important as well, so I will teach a lot of people um, and I will give them just a regular brickies hammer, bricklayer's hammer, to maybe just take a little bit off. Um, where did I, oh, I went over there, it doesn't matter. Um, but mainly I'm trying to get them to just fit the shapes together as they are, and you develop an eye for where a stone's gonna fit. You, you'll see one. There's not a lot of space here to, build up. To, to, to do it, but you can kind of... And so, Bryce, I see you're, I, I, I'm seeing you pack in the harding, yeah. and also you're shimming from so, the inside to get yes. just the right pitch to the outside stone. You, right? wanna, you wanna pin from the back in place where you want the stone to sit and then fill the air pocket. So you see there's a cavity right here. You want to take, you want to fill a space with the least amount of stones. You want to start with a bigger stone to fill that space. And then you want to maximize how much space that stone takes up. And now there's a much smaller space that you fill in with smaller stones, right? until the cavity's gone completely. You don't want to just throw a pile of really small, yeah. you don't want to just grab, basically gravel and throw that in there. So you the want, rule is basically the biggest stone you can fit in the space. Wedge it in. First. Wedge it in. Yeah. You want them all touching and pushing and pressing on each other, right? You don't, 
this would be the equivalent of like a big problem that we see in this trade is people what I call facing a wall so instead of lengthen they do the whole wall traced they run the stones they run, lengthwise they maximize the, the face yeah. footage they leave a big hollow and then they just fill it with like three-quarter trap rock and then there's no structural integrity it's completely hollow like water will run right through it and move that gravel around there's no through stones there's no length in and the most the most common failure you see would it be the sides bulging and the and the wall collapsing yeah. like that yeah. yeah or just falling over yeah <laughs> because there is no structural integrity it's base if you face a wall and fill it with gravel it's basically hollow in term from a structural standpoint there's nothing holding it together so and it works its way down when the when the when the wall shifts slightly It'll work its way down. You'll have cavities at the top, so ultimately it won't be filled. You see that a lot with walls that have failed. I love how um, you know y'all have been doing this enough and long enough that um, you know you've just developed an eye. Like rarely are you stuck like that with yeah. a rock that you can't use. Yeah, it's just too big. And <laughs> the ones you pick up, you you know, yeah, you know what you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like any trade, and I've heard you kind of talk about this, but you just have to do it, yeah. right? It's not that complicated. You learn the rules, and then you just have to put the hours in. And repetitive practice, um, it's everything. Using the rules just uh, leads to proficiency. Yeah, I mean, that was just a quick and dirty, you know, whatever. Ease, but. It's, that took no time at all. It's easy to skimp on the... I, I would say that the inside of the wall is as important... More, even. ...as, as how you're laying the face stones. Um, and it's easy to skimp because you don't see that. You can build a wall, get away, get your money, and... Take the money and run. Yeah. Change your telephone number. It's pretty easy to make a wall that looks decent enough that will fall down in five years. Yeah. Or less. I've seen that happen. I've been on jobs where they said, thanks, but no thanks. This guy says he can do it for half. And I've said, <laughs> call me when it falls down. Yeah. And they do. Yeah. Two years. It's like, hey, should have gone with you. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I mean. When, when they say, uh, that you see, it seems like you charge a lot. Well, you can be like, well, I know what my work is worth. Oh, it's, it's, like <laughs> it's not even I charge a lot. It's like I charge the right price. Yeah, the only exactly. The only way you do this job for what that guy says is that you don't actually do the job, yeah. right? Yeah. So, this is awesome, guys. Anything else you want to add to this quick intro? Um, maybe just talk about where we like this place because okay. people should know where this is. Um, you can find all the information about this place on the stonetrust.org. Yep. Um, network um website and it's it's what 25 minutes from broadway pretty Something much like that. on highway 70 um i mean nashville peters out pretty quickly this is countryside really but it is close to nashville um there's there's quite a lot of stuff going on around the area we're running courses you can see the whole yeah. we're pretty much fixing up for next year um, we've got two more this year, which are pretty much And this much place sold is out. called? This is called Kingston Springs. The actual area, this little place, which has got the garden centre, it's got the greenhouse there. We've got a small, small little animal farm. Um, we've actually got a school down there. And, uh, and this as well, this is called The Land at Kingston Springs. And they have a website as well. They've got a Facebook page too, with also lots of information about it. Excellent, excellent. So check the Stone Trust out, Stone Trust website out to find um, uh, introductory and even further courses in your area. And, uh, yeah, let's see if we can find a patch of shade to sit down and talk some more. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna sit down and and um, dive deeper into uh, craftsmanship. 
the trees. 